actually like makes you sleep. It actually gives you takes the edge off. But then when you pair it with alcohol, you're done. I just I seriously don't like the Of course, everybody <laughs> So we're going to the to Oh, really? Yeah. Hey, Tam. 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 Hey, Hey, Tam. Hey, Tam. Hey, Tam. Hey, Tam. Hey,
with that. And also we have Scott Murphy here who's going to talk to you about appraisals, short appraisals, VA issues, FHA issues, and I'm sure you've got lots of questions. So we want to give him as much time as possible. Fair enough? Right. Perfect. All right, so if you have not already looked at this, Robert said this slide, it is the most updated dot loop training slide. We have three sessions on the 14th, which is next Tuesday. 10 to 11.30, 12 to 1.30, and 2 to 3.30. As you can see, they're pretty full. It's going to be hands-on. We have a live instructor coming, national instructors. It's not going to be a, you know, a webinar. It's going to be somebody live here. So bring questions. Make sure you ask them while they're here. I asked Robert if I could attend all three because I think I need some extra help. But we'll see uh, if anybody says I do need to come again, we'll, we'll address that. So please make sure that you have signed up for those. Email Robert directly. I email Robert directly and he'll look after that. All right, perfect. All right, so just some things to know again about what's coming up and you need to register for some of these. The dot loop training, as I mentioned, is on the 14th. Then the 15th, a lot of you asked about code of ethics. So Tom Gillette is going to come and teach the code of ethics class 9 to 12. 
That'll get you three hours of CE. If you would like to attend, please make sure you shoot Rose a quick email or Rob or myself, and we'll get you on that list. Now we can sit 50, 60 people in here easily, but you need to have the code of ethics every four years for your membership in your board. So make sure that you get that done. On the 29th, I love the title of this class. You can't fix stupid. <laughs> because you know what? You can't. I mean, stupid is what stupid is. But by the same token, there's a lot of information in there about license law that we all need to be aware of. Some things that we go, I didn't realize that, or I don't know how to handle something. So please make sure again that you register with Rose, Rob, and myself for that class. It's a full day class, 9 to 4.30. Tom Gillette's going to come and teach that class. Now, anybody who's renewing after July of this year, who's that? Who needs to renew this year after July? OK, well, you better be in the class because this class is also approved for the license law portion for your license renewal. So come to it, pick up six hours of CE. It'll be a great class. Tom Gillette is dealing with it in a case study situation. So that should be pretty uh, pretty good. And you know, he loves to add some humor into each one of those. So please make sure that you register for that as well. Questions on those? All right. Mortgage Minute, Mr. Zula. All right, Showtime. 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 Yes. We are uh, talking about appraisals. I figured uh, I would talk about our process at Fidelity Bank. If uh, we do happen to see a low appraisal, you know, what can you do? What do we do internally if there's an appraisal issue? So first of all, if the listing agent or the buyer's agent wants to give us a list of comps that they think could have been included in the report, we can take that. There's a dispute form we fill out. That goes to our appraisal department. They forward it over to the appraisal because I'm not allowed to talk directly with the appraiser by law. So we'll get that over in the appraiser's hands. Usually within 24 to 48 hours, they'll respond to us and say, yeah, I missed it. I could have used this. Hey, I'm going to adjust the report and send it back to you. A lot of times there'll be silence for about 48 hours and then we'll get a new report and it hasn't changed. So sometimes that happens. Yeah. And you know, it is what it is. And so at that point, I can go to the head of our underwrite or our appraisal department. His name's Dan. We just got a new a new guy that took over and he, we're coming with a clean set of eyes. So he'll look at it, he'll take a look, and he can say, Hey, I agree with the appraiser. I think everything they used was, was in line. Or he can say, Hey, I think it's defective and we're gonna throw it out. And we're one of the few companies I've worked for in 13 years that um, will actually completely throw out an appraisal and let us order a new one. So I know I've worked at the big ones like Wells. You're stuck you get what you got. So um, that is one of the advantages I think at Fidelity is we will he will look at it if he thinks it's defective. I had one go up fifty thousand, came up fifty thousand and I had another one that came up about sixty five. So those are big numbers. So we had a question there in the back. Miss uh, Anderson City I need your help. <laughs> we've, we've got one right now we're working on. It came in about 15 light. It's a FHA yes, appraisal. FHA appraisal. And the coincidence here is I'm doing the deal for the guy that's selling his house and also the buy side. And the appraiser just happened to be the same guy for both. <laughs> I mean, what's the chances? Both FHA deals. So we're working through that. The stage that we're in with hers is it's gone back to the head of our appraisal department to review and give us a ruling that we can, you know, knock that one out. So. How long are you taking for, uh, from order of appraisal to actually getting the appraisal done? So we ordered on a Monday. Typically we'll have it back by the following Monday or even some, some of them work over the weekends. So typically within about a week. It was shorter in the slower seasons. We'd see them in four or five days. We're pretty fast. But now that it's uh, summer season, we're seeing them probably taking about a week. Some of them sooner. I actually got a VA appraisal. We ordered it. I got it in two days. Wow. Listing agent called me. Well, was someone in here called me and said, hey, the appraiser, I'm worried about him. That was you. That was you. So six Elizabeth, hours, Elizabeth days, called me. Talking. Talking. Six <laughs> hours. Okay, six hours. Hey, I was just trying to be modest here. So we ordered it, and six hours later, the appraiser was supposed to go out, and she said, I'm worried about him. They didn't show up. And I said, um, okay, let me look into it. And so before I could even look into it and get back to her, the appraisal came into my email box. I'm like, I'm like this. How was that for service? <laughs> <laughs> Mom, we gotta, we gotta tune our horns when we can when it's this busy. So, 
Anyways, um, rates right now have been holding steady. I don't know if everybody saw the unemployment numbers came in four on Friday, so that's great mm -hmm. news for all of us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> rates are going to stay low for a while. So um, uh, three and a half on a 30-year fix with some origination fees, um, three and a quarter on FHA. Arms are below 3%, so rates are good. Go out there and get some deals. Sell them while they're low. I've, I've seen a little bit of re, refinance activity pick up, so it's good. It's going to be a busy summer, hot summer. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Mr. Scanlon, we have some uh, from her vendors you wanted to introduce. Sure. Um, in the back, guys, we got Edmund Marie's and Best Movers. I'm here to join the office a little bit. And Charlie's here. Make sure you say bye. And then, of course, our homeboys with America party. Where is she? She said she couldn't stay. Even better. I'm not talking to her. All right. Um, you guys got your um, caravan stuff, right? You guys got these? I've got pictures. Okay. I've got pictures. Here. We've got lots to go look at. I Hopefully, you'll make it to all 12 in Victory. I think half the neighborhoods are still. I see them a lot. Um, and then, of course, Harbor Bridge, Harbor Landing. Um, Diana Service has hers today, so make sure we get to visit the uh, folks on, on the team. So um, we've got, all right, we're going to do money board. You play to win. All right. Cash flow. Okay. Um, Who had it first? All right, first. first what? Did we get a drum roll? Like, Mr. Oh, 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 oh. The first one. Closing. Okay. <laughs> Amy Aggie, she is in Florida. I know she's not here. And Megan Savant. <laughs> hey, she had a. Oh, that's right. She closed. She's a realtor. She closed. She went on vacation. That's how it works. That's how it works. Go to Florida. All right, so what's the next one? Who had another first? Listing, Clint McAfee. He is in Arizona on vacation. <laughs> and Megan's on vacation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. The good news for you guys, though, is that more. that means two more draws. So if you don't have your business card in here, you best get it in there before we are ready. All right, yeah. next. Top listings taken. Who was who, who working this month? Uh, <laughs> All right, Michelle Miles, Jennifer Hunt, and of course, Mr. Danny Drew, and tops our list. So, embroidered t shirt or polo? Order to order to order to order all right, perfect. All right, all right. All right. Um, number one team for top listings. Team was Pots was number two, and then you have Team Stout was number one. So Tamara. Tamara. Yeah. 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 Number. Um, lucky seven. All right. Tamara gets an embroidered T-shirt with her golf shirt. You got like six. Team Monica. You're good for the week. She's opening a store. The team yeah. has them. The team has them. <laughs> All right, next. Top new written. Ready? Drum roll. Number five, Den for Denise Quinlan. I don't know where she's at. Denise Morton, congratulations. Yay. Jennifer Hyde and Laura Coon. Is Laura here? Woo. Laura's not here. Uh, All right, Denise. Got presents to win. All right. Good. The next one here. Right, well, Denise Morton. Right. Denise Morton. Yeah. Denise, number. pick a number. Number three. $25 gift card from <coughs> Alex Flores Repairs. Ooh, oh, very nice. Nice. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. All right. Top new Richard. So what's next? Top new uh, teams. teams. Tamara Stout with number two and Miss Stovall. Yay! Yay. Yay. Number one. Number one. All right. A Century 21 beach towel. Oh. Oh. September. <laughs> and here's what we like top clothing. Top clothing. Maybe they're all on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa Tan Wadio, she's not here. Danny Druin, congratulations. <laughs> Jackie <laughs> Patterson, and of course Michelle Miles is not here. So Danny Druin. Danny Druin. Lisa's 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 Lisa's
She's online. Okay, <laughs> Danny, it's a 20 here. Can we hear from Best Deal Movers, who's a preferred vendor? Give me a hand. Yay! 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 Top team, Stovall and Team Staff. Yeah, the Duke announced this year. Yeah, Good. camera, number. Make another polo. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, Lord, nine. 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 $25 gift card from X Mold. All right. Yeah. All right, we got some more. All right, there's the group. Give everybody a hand. Let's share this stuff, okay? You're on Facebook. All right. Now, before we have Scott come up, we got to get some more stuff away. Does everybody have their card in here? Cards, please. Last chance. Jim, do you know what number you're going to take? You're in one. All right, first draw. Let's have it. Go ahead. Who is it? It is Elaine Anderson. One, two, four, five. Five. Yeah, five seconds, guys. Okay. Embroidered t shirt. Yay! Yay. Yay. Woo. All right, let's see. How about one of our interns? Joe, do you want to grab a grab card? Any card? Who we got? Uh, Marion. Marion. Marion Emmar. All right. Number one, number two. Century 21 Beach Town. All right. Oh, All right, let's go. Can you yeah. Let's have our orange guy go on. Yeah. 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 No, that's not yeah. it. That's not it. <laughs> we have got Cindy Kazerski. Yay. Yeah. Hey, I saw her. Where'd you go? Right here. There you are. Pick a number. Um, How about 10? For 10. Century 21 Beach style. All right. <laughs> 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 Woo. All right. President Foreman Garford, Mr. Lewis. You better draw me. Oh, President. <laughs> he picked his own card. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Steve Yates. All right. <laughs> Century 21 Beach Town. All right. Oh, 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 I don't own it anymore. I wonder why. <laughs> Last two. Arrow. Uh, Mr. D. Allen. Hey. 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 I'm going to go with Lucky Eight. Eight. <laughs> $25 gift card from Green Home Solutions. Oh, all right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Lutta, you want to? Last one is your t-shirt. Last one is your t-shirt. Yes, Mr. Lewis Rockefeller. <laughs> <laughs> That's a t-shirt for the car wash. A greater t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so the one you just ordered now is free. It's free. Right. Yeah. It's free. Yeah. It's free. Right. It's $30 value right there. Yeah. Yeah. And before we before we have Scott come up, I do want to let you know that we have tallied the listing contest that we had going on. At the end of everything, we ended up with an increase year over year of 25%, and we needed at least 10% to get into the, the running to have the uh, soccer stars come and visit. So we got our fingers crossed on that. And the winners, they're posted out there for that evening, fun, brewery, dinner, and just a good evening is Terminators for listing count. They had 22, your names are all out there. And Team Avengers with dollar volume of 12,152,000 for that two months. That was outstanding. So give yourselves a hand for that. Hey, you know what guys, a 25% increase year over year, that's pretty outstanding. So well done on that. All right. You're good. I didn't break it. Now, 
is the time for us to listen to what Scott has to say. I'm sure you got lots of questions. Let's talk a little bit about appraisals and how they're impacting some of our deals. Okay. Sir, you are up. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's nice to be among someone friendly people. Oftentimes, I have to come with my secret service and have a shield in front of me. And, uh, you know, I know, I know those feelings against appraisers are very much deserved in many cases. Um, you know, and I'll take on to what Jeff said, and then we'll move into some other stuff. But how about the uh, the rebuttal process? How does that work from our side? Um, it's kind of inferred that you know there's not a lot of success with the rebuttal process, and part of that is because the information that we get is often very useless or not very compelling for us to to change it. So. This is where we want to help you write that letter of rebuttal and put it in the verbiage that that underwriter is going to understand and compel that appraiser uh, to change. I mean, uh, I'm working with Eileen. We're going to try to fix that one. Um, I've already looked through the appraisal briefly, but there's so many errors that I can pick up on that you would have never noticed um, that we can make a very good case that, that there definitely needs to be another appraisal done on that one. Um, you generally have one shot at a rebuttal, so you want to make sure that you have all that information and that data prepared and, and make the best of that one shot. We can't just keep going back and back to the to the uh, appraiser. Uh, most lenders won't allow it, but most appraisers will shut down after the first one anyway. So um, another thing is, uh, you know, I can't say that our firm has never come in low on an appraisal. I hope that that should never that should never be the case. There should be situations where there there is a low appraisal, but that means that the market is working properly. But it should be a very 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 small percentage. And the way our firm operates is, if we feel we're coming in low on the appraisal, we're going to contact both agents before we turn it in and get that rebuttal information up front. I mean, we we're, we're not hiding behind this shield of the lender or or, or you know some other. Uh, means that a lot of appraisers do. We want to, we, we believe in the market. I mean, you appraisers do not determine market value, we interpret market value. So we don't go out and tell you or anybody what the property is worth. We just have some advanced skills to be able to analyze what the market is doing and determine, you know, whether this is a good loan or a bad loan, whether the value is reasonable or not reasonable. Um, so, you know, we feel that if you've got a, a buyer, a willing buyer, willing seller, particularly when it's a quick sale and when there's multiple offers, that's a very good indication that that is market value. Now, the problem is that the appraisal works in somewhat of a, a lack. I mean, we're working um, to catch up. We're working with closed sales. Uh, we're analyzing actives and pendings, but we've got to put our weight only on the closed sales. So my appraised value can only be between the adjusted values of anything that is closed. Um, one thing that we do, um, which a lot of other appraisers won't do, is if um, if there's a pending in the neighborhood that's about to close, we will hold our appraisal. We'll ask Jeff, say, hey, I know you you got another three weeks before you're closing. We're going to put this on hold for a week until that one closes because once it becomes a closed sale, now I can include it in my value. And that's pretty much what needs to happen in most every appraisal, it seems, because the market is just moving at that pace that that, that needs to happen. So. What that means is give us enough time in your uh, appraisal and financing contingencies that we have that luxury to be able to do that for you. Also have this knowledge in mind that an appraiser can do this and you may want to suggest that to him or her if it, if it becomes a case. I want you to be there at the appraisal. I know a lot of agents are very, I know you're all very busy and I understand that, um, but it's really in your best interest to be there and meet the appraiser. Uh, supply them with all the comparables that you feel are relevant, the good and the bad. Don't hide the bad ones. Actually, they're more important to give to him by, and then put notes on there. Just write right on the FMLS sheet what you know about it, why it sold low, what the issue was with it, um, and so on. So that's that's very helpful information. Hopefully, the appraiser is knowledgeable about the local area, but even still, um, most of my appraisers uh, you know, work in the areas that they live, but they're still covering many subdivisions and many areas. And we may not have been back in Aberdeen in a while, or we may not have been in old Atlanta in you know six or eight months. And you've been in there working, and you've been in these these comparable properties probably, and you know uh, what's going on. So that information is invaluable to an appraiser, and hopefully he will accept that information from you. He should take it. Um, you know, sometimes you can just leave it there with a chocolate or, you know, I like wine, but, <laughs> you know, they, these some appraisers, just like agents, have egos and you've got to stroke them and, you know, be careful uh, how you present things. But 
their job is to accept information. Their job is to verify information. So the appraiser that comes out and says, I'm not allowed to talk to you, don't give me that information, that's wrong. Um, now, are you gonna get anywhere arguing with them? Maybe, maybe not, but know that um, you are allowed to talk to appraisers. There are no rules out there that says you can't talk to appraisers. The rule that's clouding the issue is that loan officers are not allowed to discuss value with an appraiser. But Jeff and I can talk, and it's a fidelity issue as to how much we can talk about. Um, but you know, the CDCP or whoever, all the people that uh, regulate the uh, the loan officers, it really comes down to we can't discuss value. Uh, but a lot of lenders um, have really clamped it down that loan officers can't talk to appraisers at all. But agents can, yes. Um, backing up to the bad houses that you're competing against, yes. because we are dealing with a lot of multiple offers. Mm -hmm. When the appraiser is going in and checking on the other sales and say you do have a house that was quite low, how extensive do they get in their search on that particular house? I mean, are they going back and looking at that old appraisal or are they just pulling it up off the listing service and seeing what's written there? Great question. Uh, the, uh, the appraisals that we produce are never available to anybody else. Okay, so I can't do that. Now you might say, wait, what about that red link thing or something? All we're doing there is putting physical data into a database. So I would be able to look up the square footage, the room count, all of that that the appraiser verified, but I'd never be able to see his appraisal. So when we're looking at our comparables, we are studying your listing. So you know, giving us as much detail as you can when you list a property is very important. Um, giving as many photographs, of course, uh, any virtual tours, anything like that, we're going to look at and, and um, you know, take into consideration. Hopefully we've been in a lot of these properties. That's the goal of you know, to be able to see as many. And I know Tuesdays all my appraisers eat free because we're going to show up at one of your open houses. <laughs> um, that way I get to see it before it sells and then I have that knowledge of it. So also with a firm as large as ours, maybe someone else in the office has done it. So then we actually would be able to see that other appraisal um, and take that information into consideration. So, um, but yeah, anything like that that you can give us. Now, what about, uh, okay. So one of the problems that we have is there's just not a lot of a lot of sales out there. There's we can't get we're in this there's this little groove right now where there's not enough available for our people that want to list to go out and buy. So we're kind of in this stuck holding pattern. Um, and new construction is what's the problem, and it's it's picking up, it's getting there. So I would think by next summer we should be back to a normal level where there's a lot of new construction, and we're already starting to see it when builders start to build spec homes again. That's sort of a good sign for what we're talking about because that's giving immediate inventory uh, that buyers have and um, you know a lot more options. Then your 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 sellers that want to list the, the resales will be able to do so. Um, so we'll get moved in there. So you know what happens if the last two in your neighborhood were just the worst, crappiest houses, the worst models? You know it's just a, a um, you know you can't control that. We just have to work work around that the best that we can and try to. Um, try to, to, to get the value to where, where it really should be. Another problem is an appraiser should never have an effect on market value. And um, I feel that when you get a bad appraisal and we don't fight to get it overturned and you've got that seller who's just desperate, they've got to sell, they just say, fine, I'll take the $15,000 hit and I'm gone. Everyone else in the neighborhood should go and you know jump on this guy and say, you're crazy, you're hurting us all. So, um, and I, I hate that because the appraiser should never be the one to have that effect. Had the appraiser not been there, had it been a cash deal, that would have sold, it would have been a comparable. Every other house now would have listed five or 10,000 above that one, but now we've actually regressed and gone back down some, and that's very frustrating. Um, so, but we, we are regulated. We do have to defend this to the lender, and there are times that I feel there's a difference between Fannie Mae market value and true market value. When I do my, um, my consultation appraisals for you, we give you the true market value, but I also keep a very close eye on what the Fannie Mae value would be. If there are any, any things in the appraisal that would cause it to be maybe more conservative or go in a slightly different direction when the bank appraiser comes along, because I wanna be able to still defend you. But uh, we are able to be a little bit more liberal and um, you know, Fannie Mae says that you've got a pool, you have to have a pool count. Well, I might have to go six miles away to find a pool or something. Um, you know, and all these different rules. There's tons of rules. Actually, I, I should restate that. They're not rules. They're guidelines. There's not a single appraisal that goes out of my office that doesn't violate at least one Fannie Mae guideline. <laughs> so it's just the way it is. You know, I had to go more than a mile. That's a guideline. I had to go back more than six months. 
the guideline and all these other things are guidelines. All I have to do is say there weren't any better comparables that I could have used that wouldn't have violated the guidelines. And I did this because of this, this, and this. Um, sometimes it is good, it is warranted to go a mile or two to stay in the same school district rather than go you know half a mile and go into a different county or different school district. So there's there's a lot of good rationale to, to violate or, or, or not um, adhere to these guidelines. So um, and, and the appraiser needs to understand you know and in Elaine's case the appraiser said I, I can't go out of the neighborhood and that's crazy. He had he had no good comparables in the neighborhood. He's using like what. what our subject was a two traditional two-story home with an, with an unfinished basement, which is a little rare. You know, most people finish their basements. So he's using ranches on slabs. He's using, I mean, all this crazy <laughs> stuff. What would a buyer for a two-story home on an unfinished basement, where else would they look? Would they consider that ranch on a slab? No way. So you do need to go outside the neighborhood. You do need to go up to the next most similar area, the next most similar neighborhood, and utilize those comparables. So, I don't understand why he is it normal to go back a year, June 2015? No, it's not normal. It's a completely different market. Now, again, there's a Fannie Mae guideline. You've got to show me a comparable that has an unfinished basement. So I might throw that in as like my ninth comparable, you know? Wow. Um, and, you know, may, I, and they should have made a, a sizable time adjustment for the difference in the market uh, today to that. I think I love you now. Well, <laughs> we'll hope we can work this out. Um, so, you know, you've got to. Put yourself in the shoes of a typical buyer when you're setting up your comparables, when you're doing your CMAs, and when an appraiser is too. Um, you know, there's a guideline that says you're supposed to stay in the neighborhood, but that doesn't mean you just use a bunch of crap against yours. You've got to use good comparables, and if they're not there, then go outside the neighborhood. Um, the only rule that, that sort of pertains to that is, well, there is another rule. Um, new construction. You know, D.R. Horton's building this neighborhood over there. I can't just stay in that neighborhood for all those comparables because they could be doing something funky. They could be giving away free BMWs and the, inflating the values. So I've got to test them by going and using another builder and going outside the neighborhood or using resales. So if there's been any resales in the neighborhood, that's perfect. That's really a good test. So, uh, yes. I was the one that called you last month where I had the house appraised 15,000 loaves and you yeah. appraised it. And when I asked him about you coming in, like you had suggested, the um, lender said they absolutely would not allow another appraisal. And you had said that he had no business doing the appraisal because he didn't have um, access to FMLS or yeah. Right. Their, their response was that, well, he's FHA approved, so you're out of luck. Yeah. And he didn't change a single thing on it after verbally telling me that he could. Yeah. 48 hours, literally at midnight, he sent it back to the <coughs> So yeah. I don't understand how, you know, you can That's get that bad of an appraiser and a lender not you know, right. address that. How they should address that. that. Yeah. <laughs> I know, they should address that because FHA is no magical designation. That just means that I'm, I've been approved by, by HUD to do appraisal. So he still has to abide by all the... the the, the appraisal rules and everything that he's regulated by the state. If we had had you do like a pre-list appraisal though, since they have their own lender, would that have done any good or not since it's FHA? And they yes, have different it guidelines? definitely would have because then you would have had that appraisal available to give to him and he would have utilized, utilized that information. He also would have known that you had an appraiser on your team and that, you know, he's got to make sure that he dots all the I's and crosses all of his T's and, you know, we got into this value. These are the comparables that we use. So he's going to have to really have some compelling data to come in significantly lower than that. So, yes, Mike. Yeah, uh, Scott, this builds on what she said about a pre-listing appraisal. Uh, I have a property under contract right now, over in Walmart. Yeah. Okay. And it was a unique property, uh, a lot more the details. There weren't any comparables in the neighborhood. Yeah. So I talked to my my sellers and I said, I really think we need to do it. Yeah. So we called you, we sent over Curtis. He did the appraisal, and it came in in the high, the high threes, and right. something they, they were satisfied with. And the key thing about that was, of the three properties he used as comps, two out of the three he had been in and done the appraisals for. So now we have a value of three XX, and we priced it seven thousand dollars below the appraisal. It sold at or one under contract, yep. full price. Yep. Today the appraisal is coming from the bank. Right on that. Right. Now, I'm going to meet them there with the appraisal, et cetera. Yep. What happens? What's the process if, for some reason, he comes in lower than the 
So we'll immediately step in, and now we'll be able to write a rebuttal and get it back to within 48 hours. So I'm going to try to pull some strings and help Elaine get hers done quicker, but her situation, and she called me yesterday, and I told her we were going to be 7 to 10 days because we got to come out and do a full appraisal. So we've got this. Uh, you've got it, boom. And that's the other thing is that, you know, you've got to keep that transaction moving. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, to, to your point, too, is the, the lender said they wouldn't accept another appraisal ordered by you outside of them, and that is true. But we can utilize that appraisal. We can do an appraisal for you in that situation, and we can turn it in as the basis for our rebuttal. Um, and and that, that's something that we, we can look at. Yes. What do you charge for a pre-listing appraisal? Pre-listing appraisal is four twenty-five, up to about a seven hundred fifty thousand dollars property, or something with acreage, or something weird. So, yeah, that's just our standard fee. So, um, <clears throat> how many listing services are there now in Atlanta? I'd argue there might be almost three. ZMLS, right? Yeah. <laughs> they haven't called it that, but I call it that. Yeah. I've heard of agents now actually putting stuff into Zillow first and seeing if it goes, and then if not, then they come in. Um, if they've got, you know, that that um, that, what is that called? The uh, contract to list. What is it? Um, they've agreed with the seller to list the property. Um, they're required to put it into FMLS and Georgia MLS. They don't have an option whether they sell it as Zillow or not. So. Um, it, frust it frustrates me a little bit or it's going to cause more issues for us as appraisers because we need to have ready access to those comparables. They need to be properly exposed. Now, Zillow is an exposure source, so that probably satisfies that part of it. But being able to uh, to be able to find that data uh, when we need it. Same thing with uh, other pocket listings or for sale by owners. Um, we can use those as comparables. Um, we just need to have as much information as possible. We need to verify what they did, in fact, sell for. So if it hasn't been recorded yet, uh, if you can get a copy of the HUD statement, that would be great. Um, another way to do it, if you needed to or you needed an assistant appraiser, is you can go into GSCCCA and pull up the PT61, which usually gets recorded within 24 to 48 hours, uh, a little quicker than the county does. So you'd have that information. But the biggest problem we then face is what condition was it in? You know, what kind of upgrades did it have? So any information that you can get about about um, the property like that, any photos that you might happen to be able to get, or anything you can help assist the appraiser, because that would be the point at which I might have to throw the comparable out. And some lenders um, are try to be pretty strict about um, not utilizing comparables that aren't in the multiple listing service. Part of the problem, or part of the reason, is is there needs to be a trail, a reviewer, or somebody else uh, looking at this appraisal or this loan package needs to be able to go back and verify all of this information. And so. Please, even if you do sell it in a day, please put it into FMLS and Georgia MLS. I know it costs that 0.0012% or whatever. I understand that. Um, but it's very, very important. And the other backside to this, which none of you would really know or realize, is that um, the market is appreciating right now, right? So the appraiser should go in and determine what the appreciation rate is. We have a standardized way of doing that, and that is um, through what we call a market conditions report. And that information is extracted from the predominant multiple listing servers. So everything in this area, we're going to use FMLS. I go into FMLS, and I can actually show you all how to do it. It's pretty simple. Um, and I, I create a search, and I put my uh, date parameter going back at uh, 365 days. And then I go and I hit print. And then one of the print options is a 1004 MC. It's called 1004 MC, market conditions. And it prints out this sheet, and it tells me, what happened in the, uh, a year ago, what happened in the quarter uh, after that, the quarter after that, the quarter after that. So if you can see that there were uh, 10 houses sold and then 12, then 15, and then 18, and that values went from you know 316 to 325 to 407, I can calculate my um, appreciation. What happens if the two best sales in your neighborhood went pocket listing or didn't go into the multiple listing service? They're not gonna show up in my data. And we had situations, I think it was year before last, where Laurel Springs was showing a decline during the summer. There was no way, but it was because the two key, two or three key sales didn't make it into the multiple listing service. And it's virtually impossible for me to interject that data in. Um, and most appraisers won't, you know, know to even look for it or do it. So, um, you know, and then another thing, there's a lot of appraisers out there that don't understand exactly what they're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be analyzing data. We're supposed to be looking at it. If the 1004MC comes back and tells me that 
you know, old Atlanta um, is declining right now, I should scratch my head and go back and, and re look at this and figure out what the problem is in my calculations. I shouldn't just take that at face value. That's one of the biggest problems that we see or one of the biggest errors that we see when we're reviewing these appraisals is guys just aren't thinking. They're just using the math, you know, and they're applying the numbers, doing the adjustments, doing everything the way that they're supposed to, but they're not really thinking about it. So uh, we can go back and really uh, hammer them on that. And I'll, the other thing that really, uh, you know, it's, it's enjoyable to me, actually, go find an appraisal that was done. You know, Elaine's got one in her hands. Everyone's got a couple appraisals around. Look at the very bottom line of the grid. You know, that, that's what we call the adjusted values and put them into a range. So take the lowest one and the highest one and then put it into the sentence. And so you've got a, an appraiser who's saying, I feel, I, Mr. Appraiser, feel this house is worth between 172 and 369. I mean, how valuable is that statement? Yeah, he came in at the purchase price or yeah, he averaged or whatever he did, but no, that range should be very tight. Um, you know, if you're selling at 250, you might be in the 230s and you might be in the 270s. There, are, There is no exact one number any house is worth and it's difficult sometimes to get all the adjustments, but you should be in a very tight range. We don't average those numbers. We weight them. Which one is the most recent? Which one's the most similar to the subject? Which one has the least number of adjustments? So, um, you know, we're going to weight them in different ways to come up with a value that's somewhere between that range. Yes. Scott, when you're doing the 10F4MC, um, kind of in a neighborhood like Willow Springs or Fruitsville where there's a variety of price points, yes. how, how do you... Great question. That? Uh, when we're creating that data and putting it into this form, we're supposed to use comparable okay. properties. And that was another thing I saw on Elaine's uh, appraisal is he said there were, I don't remember the number, but like 264 sale, comparable sales um, in the subject neighborhood. No, there weren't. He didn't... He didn't that's 264 sales total in that neighborhood, but not comparable sales. So when I'm doing the million dollar home in Laurel Springs, I'm going to use homes that are like 800,000 and up. And it's not going to necessarily be just Laurel Springs. It'll be the whole South Forsyth area. It'll include St. Marlowe and Creekstone and other things. So, but they need to be comparable. And that's an awesome question because isn't it possible that the multi-million dollar market might actually be climbing a little bit right now? But the three and four hundred thousand is like on fire. Um, you know, so you've got to analyze the specific submarket, that specific price range uh, that are truly comparable properties. So uh, can you talk a little bit about percentages? I know a lot of people always have questions of remodeling. Yeah, how much you know for a room, a kitchen, or a bathroom, whatever. What is the percentage that you guys go out and say, give an example, they remodeled the kitchen and uh, the cost was 10 grand? Mm -hmm. What percentage do you give to that? That's a difficult question to answer because sometimes the, the kitchen was in excellent condition and they just went in and changed all the colors or something. So maybe they don't get as much back for that. But you do a major renovation like that, particularly kitchens, it's a very high percentage. And Realtor, um, you know, the Realtor magazine um, that does that surveys every year, I feel those are very accurate. So uh, when you do read those, feel that they are pretty accurate. So they're going to be in like the, the high 80s to high 90 percent return on investment in kitchens and bathrooms usually. Um, so we often would rec recommend that. And that's part of our consultation service too is, you know, what should you do? Should you replace these countertops or should you just sell the house as is? And we can give you um, values either way. Um, I'm just, I'm doing one over off of uh, Bagley Road right now. You know, it's that Stone, Stone Creek, Stone Valley or something, that neighborhood. And he had this, uh, he was the smallest home in the neighborhood and he has this unfinished, um, all, but all studded out up over the garage with a whole bedroom and a bathroom and everything. And he got bids on it and it was about $15,000 bid. And I said, definitely, because for the bathroom, you're going to get at least $10,000 adjustment. The bedroom, you're going to get another $10,000. And then 400 square feet, he was going to pick up probably about fifteen to $20,000. He's probably going to raise the value of the home about $40,000 for a $15,000 investment. And it helps the marketability issue of us being the smallest home with the smallest number of bedrooms and bathrooms. So that type of thing was, was yes, you definitely should go ahead and do it. Um, so we can do those kind of those kind of analysis. But there are no specific numbers. Um, hopefully all of you are reading the articles that I write every month in the uh, Georgia Real Estate Commission. You get a newsletter every month. If you're not getting it, either it goes to your spam or you've uh, delisted yourself, go back in and subscribe again 
and then just jump right to my article if you don't want to read the rest of the stuff. But I, I write some very timely articles, and I would love your suggestions on topics. Right now, it's exactly I'm talking about uh, adjustments, and you know I give you the website to go to to find the adjustments. It's like there is no website.com um, is the name of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> there is no website. We do teach a class, though, called our um, Appraiser's Guide to CMAs, where we will give you some of these numbers that I swear have never been put on pen to paper, but I give you some rough numbers. Okay, if you're in the $100,000 price range, this is the adjustment that you should make for a bedroom, a bathroom, and so on. Because isn't it different if you're in a $100,000 price range or a million dollar price range? Sure. The bathroom in a hundred thousand dollar price range might be worth five thousand, but in a million dollars, it's going to be worth twenty or thirty thousand dollars. So <laughs> we we give you some of those numbers, and we can go ahead and get that class back on the schedule over here and that do that. Awesome. Yeah. And then last summer we taught that uh, field trip class. We can teach that again this summer too, where we actually go out and do an appraisal in a in a house. And then I have another class that y'all, some of you might be interested, some of you might just want to sit back and watch, but. It's somewhat, somewhat along those lines, because probably the most important factor in a home is square footage, right? And we talk in all of our classes, what is gross living area? How do you determine gross living area? How do you measure a house? And I touched on how to measure a house a little bit, but I thought, hey, it might be kind of fun to do a challenge. So we're going to take a house, and we're going to teach a class out in a house, like we did with the field trip class, but it's going to be all about the square footage. And you're going to be able to get a team, maybe three or four of you. And we're going to give you the, we're going to probably bring one of our appraisers along with you to take the technology out of it. But we'll have an iPad and a, you'll get a laser and you're going to measure it. And then Mike's team's going to measure it and everyone's team's going to measure it. And we'll, we'll see how it all comes out and we'll have some prizes or something. But it'll be fun and you'll learn a lot about you know, what is square footage, how do you measure, how do you take this into consideration and all that. So. One more question I have is, uh, I know there's been a lot of questions people have asked me. And uh, it's a big thing about basements and how you measure what is considered the square footage, what you really can, you know, the land touching the ground, you know, all that stuff. Uh, there's a lot of question on that. Can you talk yes. a little bit about it? Uh, in order for us to, to truly compare one property to another, we have to come up with some rules and standards. So many, many years ago, the um, appraisal organizations went to the um, American National Measuring Standards Institute, ANSI, the same people that say that this cup is, you know, 9.4 ounces. And they brought together a bunch of experts, uh, appraisers, realtors, uh, builders, and architects, and they came up with some rules. And there's a, about a 23-page book, and if you'd like to have that book, uh, you can go to my website, uh, dsmurphy.com, and go into resources or something and download that book and have it in your presentation folders. When the homeowner starts to argue with you about gross living area, you've got something in print. Um, but basically the bottom line is, and the, the, the boiled down version of the definition is, if you put your foot on the floor of any given level, and any portion of that floor is at all below the grade of the ground, we need to consider this separately. Now, you know, if you just got a foot or something over there, that's a gray area and we'll probably work with that. But what we're really talking about are basements, right? We all know what a basement is and what a basement is. And, you know, split levels and split foyers get a little complicated. But your traditional two-story homes or ranches, it's either a basement or it isn't a basement. And that just has to be counted separately. It's not that I'm not going to give you value for it, and not that I'm not going to give you significant value for it. Did one in in, um, in Sugarloaf uh, a year or two ago. The basement was nicer than the upstairs. They had just done it. Ten foot ceilings, interior stone, tons of light. That's a big part of it. So I actually was adjusting $100 a square foot above grade. I adjusted $100 a square foot below grade. So it is possible to get to that same value as above grade. But generally, it's going to be something like 60 to 70 percent of the value of above grade, and that's not because appraisers say that, or really even because ANSI says that. It's because they we've analyzed data of buyers and sellers, and this is what buyers and sellers have agreed upon. And you know, again, in my 30-something years of appraising, using these numbers and these percentages, it just seems to always work out. So. Uh, the appraiser does have that latitude, though, to move within that, that probably 50 to 100 percent um, adjustment range for the above grade versus below grade. And we test it. And sometimes um, I might be too high with my adjustment or I might be too low. And once I've got all my comparables adjusted, I see that this comparable is adjusting up way up here and this one's adjusting down here. Well, maybe I should give more to my square footage in the basement adjustment and it brings this one up and this one down. So we play with that a lot. We do this seesaw and it's called bracketing. And so we can get real deep into the science of appraising at some point if you ever wanted to. 
but um, there's there's a lot of science, but there's also a lot of art, and that's part of the art too, is knowing how to handle these comparables and how to make these adjustments, because there just are no list of adjustments. So we have to extract them from the market every time. So. What is this first, has there been any discussion <laughs> it is very important. But one of the things you got to think is about the too. Monetary value of that? What is the monetary value of multiple offers? Um, it's difficult to really boil that down and, and, and separate it because sometimes what happens in multiple offers is you get people that are kind of going crazy. Yeah. And there's a point at which we need to remember too that we're protecting the bank and the borrower. Not just the seller over here, right? We're, we've got to be even. So there's a point at which it maybe should come in a little bit low. And there are also some agents out there who say, just go 25000 above, way above, because we know the appraisal won't come in, and then they'll have to renegotiate. So we've got a lot of that going on, there too. There is some of that. But, you know, in the, you know, the two to the two 250s or even under the twos where yeah. there's such limited inventory. Right. are fighting. Yeah. I mean, you're getting to $12,000. Yeah. Easy. Yeah, sometimes even more than that. Right. And then, you know, it gets adjusted and the, the seller's like, hey, you're said that you don't want to be willing to pay this. You've got to bring the difference. Right. Of course, he's going to pay me. Right. So, I mean, yeah, ideally it'd be wonderful if you just strike the appraisal contingency from your contract and we have to close, <laughs> but they, they can't do it. And, you know, our difficulty, of course, is the market you know, hasn't heated up that much. And I've got these comps that are ten or fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 lower. Um, they're 30 it, days old, which is a completely different market than yeah, we made yeah. so how it's yeah. very difficult for me to make an adjustment for a property that just sold a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. It's a, still the same current market. But boy, y'all adjusted it down for time changed. when we were falling. But we, I'm not seeing those adjustments for time as we're rising. And it's difficult to extract right. those. But even if I said it was 5% or something, it's not going to be enough to get you up. So it, it is, it's, a, it's a big challenge. It's a challenge. And we're trying to do the best we can to reflect the actions of buyers and what the market truly is. The lender wants to know, though, if they turned around and resold this property, would they be able to sell this? I mean, if, if the music stopped and the frenzy stopped, is it still are people still going to pay that? Or if like eight or nine more properties came on the market, would we be able to sustain that that value? Do um, you, you by any chance use the day on the market uh, when situations like that happen? Yes. If you have a subdivision that is selling quick, and then yep. you have multiple offers, which is what. Yeah. We're finding out. Yeah. Uh, do you go back and look, look at very the market? Very days on market, and then also, you know, I've got that range, right? That adjusted range. So I'm going to go to the very highest to the penny as I can in my range because the market is going, and I'm already at added for the appreciation. Well, it's just you know the market is appreciating, so somebody's got to be the next one that gets exactly. like five thousand more, mm -hmm. six thousand. But you know, right. But as the from the appraiser side. I feel like it's you know, you're kind of you're kind of slowing us back down. We're oh. we're looking in the future. We're looking for behind this guy to come it's together. War. Exactly. It is, it is. And you know, we try to let the market go, but we just have to be able to I'm gonna speak to that on this because actually I've been using some language in the contract that says that the buyer and this really only has to do with the multiple offers. The buyer will cover that difference, and I know it is hard with some of the starter homes because most people don't have any money. But when you have the multiple offers, and you write something in there that says, you know, I'm willing to give you five thousand dollars more than um, than the appraisal comes in, or just whatever the number is. I have one that I did twenty five thousand dollars higher because it was almost five hundred thousand dollars. And you know what? The ones that have funds will step up to the plate and they will sign that contract. Mm -hmm. So my question to you, you're getting a copy of that contract. Yeah. How is the appraiser looking at language like that and is it a problem? And I guess Jeff probably needs to answer to this as well because so far I haven't had a problem or kickback with anybody saying, hey, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just creative and yeah, you know, great. it's just something that no I'm trying to get the prices up. Right. And, yeah, yeah, that means that in the long run. run. Does that yeah. affect the, the language? Thing? doesn't affect me at all. Okay. I think it's a great thing to do if you can get it, if it works with that buyer. Um, but does it have way influence on the appraisal mind as he's going through or she to, to, to try to get that value of that offer? So that well, all I want them to do is appraise it to what we actually made the offer at. But if the offer comes in low, right. the buyer then is saying, yes, I'm willing to pay extra on the property. And so then that gets my seller a little bit more money in their pocket. Right. And uh, I have one that's supposed to have closed yesterday for $9,000 above yep. the appraisal. The other thing about multiple offers is give the appraiser all those contracts, or at least the first page, or at least a 
a write-up on it because maybe, maybe the appraiser does get to your value, but we're not done yet. We've got to convince that underwriter, right. um, you know, right. that that we're that this is legitimate, and so all the ammunition that I can I can put in there. Of course, you're going to have probably already have a um, a list of improvements, so we want that. And on that list of improvements, um, you can put dollar amounts. You know, sixty-two thousand dollars in the kitchen, this that. Also, give me the year on our newer form here. We have to say the kitchen was done in the last one year, one to five years, five to ten. So, if you give me the year, that's helpful as well. We still have four or five more minutes. We will go ahead and get these classes set up. Um, so you'll see those coming through. They're all for CT. Um, if you absolutely have to have something tomorrow, just go to our website. We're teaching like almost every day somewhere. And you're, you're welcome to um, attend anywhere that we teach. Um, think about, uh, we're happy to come out and teach this in one of your listings. So, um, you know, the Hennigers hosted us last time when we did the one over in Creekstone. And, um, that was that was a great time. So we can come out and teach a house. I would you like to have about sixty agents from all over this area to come sit in your house? Oh, anywhere in the metro area. I've got appraisers all around Atlanta that will teach. Yeah. But a really big house. I'm going to get everybody into. Also, <laughs> to that point, we actually I'm not, I have offices actually all down through Florida. If you have any property in Florida that you need appraised, um, also um, California. We have offices in California now as well, and. Um, South Carolina, North Carolina. So really, any appraisal need you need anywhere, um, we'll happy to help you. Perfect. All right. Last question. Where do you go to sign up for your uh, monthly newsletter? Oh, to get the monthly newsletter, go to the Georgia Real Estate Commission, mm -hmm. and then there's probably a button in there for newsletter, and then there's a button to sign up. Okay. One last thing. Um, we are. I was hoping to be able to fully roll this out today, but it's not quite ready yet. We're about to roll out something called Agents Advantage. And what Agents Advantage is, it's going to be uh, giving you the ability to get access to Redlink, which is now called Comflow. So you'll be able to get access to that data. You'll be able to get access to a special page on our website, which has all of our articles. It's going to have videos. A lot of them are designed to try to help convince your seller to to do an appraisal, or we have a video about what is gross living area, all this kind of stuff. It's all going to be tied together with an app, too. You'd be able to have the app and sit in there with your tablet and with your client. And also, you'll have discounts on appraisals. So it's a subscription thing. It's $20 a month, but you'll get $25 off an appraisal each month. So it more than pays for itself just right there. So once this launches, and we're waiting for the app guy to get finished, probably in the next week, I'll send you this information, and you'll be able to sign up for that. Great. Thanks very much. It depends on how complicated it is. <clears throat> it is what it's but if, if it's just a couple of 10 acres, it's still probably going to be $100. Now it's 10, 20, or 30 acres in one. Do a subdivision analysis, we can do that too. We have more appraisers that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, before we wrap up, Let's give Scott one more round. Thank you very much. Thank you. And please, if you can, go and support Kelly and Maureen over in Vickery and um, Diane down in Windward. So thank you. Have a great day. Go list something. Which, thank one, you guys. which one is their house? You, know? uh, you should have the list that Hyro sent out already. Hyro sent an email. He sent an email out with their problems on it. Thank you, guys. Thank you.